Let's come before our God now and ask him to lead us. Our Heavenly Father, we just thank you that the almighty God of heaven and earth is here with us now. Your spirit is leading us. You are the one who is opening up scripture and speaking to us. And we just pray, Lord, please give us ears to hear, hearts that are ready to respond to your words today. Lord God, of course, we always pray that the speaker, please don't let them be seen at all, but Jesus Christ, your son, be seen today. The glory of our God be shown. I pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so, I guess uh, one of my first thoughts with this message is, did you know that for centuries we have been grafting many fruit trees onto good rootstock? You know, we often think about roses. They often have a good rootstock and our, our fruit trees, our, uh, what do you call it? olives, our, um, oh, my brain's gone blank, uh, olives, you know, grapes, a lot of citrus, they all get grafted onto a rootstock. And this rootstock is essentially a, <clears throat> a species of plant that's similar, but has been shown to give good benefits to the plant. So we develop rootstock that often has uh, drought tolerance or pest resistance. And by grafting other plants onto it, we can improve that actual plant that we're hoping for. And so I want you to kind of have that picture in your mind that Jesus Christ is the good rootstock he is the one that really helps us grow and live for him and it's his goodness that really helps us endure and uh, live in his glory so just for a bit of context chapter 15 they're in the upper room Jesus and his disciples are celebrating the Passover together. Jesus is keenly aware that that very night he is going to be betrayed, that he is going to be arrested, that he will be beaten, he will be whipped and flogged. And worst of all, in just a few hours' time, he'll be nailed to a cross, bearing on himself, in his body, the punishment for all of our sin. He's keenly aware that this is about to happen. And so he takes this time to share important words to his disciples. He knows that when they see him, get arrested, when they see him being charged and going through this mock trial, they're going to run and hide. They're going to flee from him. Even Peter, one of his closest friends, is going to deny ever knowing him. And Jesus takes this precious few hours in the upper room to prepare them, to give them the lessons they need for when they finally see the truth of Jesus, see who Christ truly is. And I wonder, are we sort of like that? Like the disciples? We know Christ. <coughs> We've been to church many times. But do we really have a personal relationship? Are we truly, truly connected to Christ, the one and only vine of life? 
So I really like this illustration that Christ has used, that idea that abiding in him truly means to be connected, to be fully absorbed into Christ. It's not walk with Christ hand in hand down the street. It's Christ. You are actually in Christ. It's not a buddy relationship. It's you become one with Christ when you abide with him. What a thing to have. What an opportunity. To abide with Christ means that we receive, we trust that everything, everything that we need is supplied through God by our Saviour. Abiding is receiving Christ and trusting him. It's receiving Jesus so that our souls fully depend on him and trust in him. In verse 3 we read, You were clean, you were already clean, because of the word I have spoken to you. If you abide in my words, you'll also, uh, you will ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. In verse 9, just as the Father has loved me, so also I have loved you. Abide in my love. And again in verse 11, these things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Abiding in Christ means that we receive, we take in his words. His words are going into our heart to change us. Abiding in Christ means that we receive and take in his love. Knowing that even though we are fallen and we fall short, he loves us completely. He loves us fully. Receiving Christ means knowing that even in those hard times, you have joy that your Saviour lives, that your joy is filled. So a heart that abides in Christ wholeheartedly, depends on him, believes him, receives his words, his love, and receives his joy. This passage, it tells us that if we do abide in Christ, we will bear much fruit. We all want to live a life, don't we, that we feel is fruitful. We want to feel like our life overflows with love and joy. These are things that everyone around the world wants, seeks after. But how do we actually have a life that genuinely is fruitful? You know, the world offers us many temptations, many tempting solutions, such as, you know, you could dedicate all of your time to find satisfaction and love in a family. All the time. You could have a job that you're really passionate about, and that that should bring you satisfaction and joy. You could climb the corporate ladder. You could buy the latest and newest gadgets. These things will be, you know, the only thing that you'll ever need. The world holds these things up as a key to being satisfied to having a truly fulfilled life, but we know families sometimes fight and let each other down. 
We know that a job will never fully satisfy. We know that none of these things will ever bring us lasting joy or a true sense of fulfilment. So where do we get an, a, a fruitful life from? Well, verse 5 tells us, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Again in verse 8, Jesus says, My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciple. When we live in obedience to Christ, when we trust him for all of our needs, when we allow Jesus to lead us and guide us, our lives will be more fruitful than we could ever imagine. The key is that we've got to have our focus on Christ. The key is that we've got to trust that he is guiding us even if the road feels rocky, even when the road feels like we're heading down a valley, trust that Christ is leading you. He is guiding you. He will make you fruitful if you trust in him. And what a lovely thought. I like that in verse 8. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Living a life that trusts Christ and allows him to work through your life will produce fruit and that fruit will show that you are Truly a child of God. Christ's work in our lives. We see his peace filling our hearts. We see his love and his kindness flowing through. Your gentleness becomes evident to those around you. The fruit of Jesus Christ is that we become the light in this world. We become the salt that attracts people. They see that you genuinely are different. You're not like the other people because you have Christ. So brothers and sisters, I encourage us, abide in Christ. Allow him to work through you so you can produce fruit to prove that you truly are God's child. Jesus tells us that I am the vine. I am the vine. I am the true vine. Which kind of points out if he is the true vine, in fact, it kind of means that there are false vines that we can actually be connected to. And there might be some of those things that we talked about earlier. A false vine is putting everything, my identity, being abiding in my career, putting everything I have into my family, putting everything I have into having the right things, being with the right people. But Christ is telling us that these things will fall short. 
They will never bring us eternal satisfaction. They will never produce fruit of any worth. They're unable to produce any fruit at all. But in Jesus, the true vine, he reminds us that the vine gives life to the branches. Without the vine, those branches, as it described, dry up. Uh, Let me find that. I've lost it. Oh, yeah, yeah, verse 6. The branches that don't abide, they dry up. They're gathered up and they're cast into a fire. They're useless and worthless. They make for a lovely bonfire in the spring. And that's it. If we're not connected to Christ, our life produces no fruit of any significant value. Nothing of eternal worth at all. In John 10, Jesus tells us, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. In John 14, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Does it fill your heart with joy to know that Jesus is the true vine and he is calling us to abide in him, to be connected to him so that his goodness, his righteousness will flow into our lives, that he will work through us, making our lives fruitful. All the while, our Heavenly Father is the vine dresser working in us to help us grow. And so, amidst this passage, kind of verse 6, like we touched on earlier, it, that's a really sobering passage. Sobering verse, verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, He is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather, gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. And going back to verse 2, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he, that's God the Father, takes away. Those two verses together really made me think about Jesus and when he was uh, talking in Matthew 7. And he said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons. And in your name perform many miracles. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Brothers and sisters, it's wonderful to know that we can be connected to Christ. It's a joy that should fill us. But we need to. We need to make certain of our calling. We need to know that Christ is having a deep, transforming impact on our lives. That we genuinely are connected deep within our hearts and not just a superficial external fruitlessness. We're not playing around with churchianity. 
but we are genuinely, genuinely connected with Christ. Philippians 2, oh, sorry, yeah, Philippians chapter 2 instructs us to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Please take your salvation seriously. Examine yourself. See if there's fruit. In 2 Peter chapter 1, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. And in 1 John chapter 2, 19, this is very similar to what I was sharing earlier about Matthew. They went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out so that it would show that they were not of us. There are many of us who come to church each week because we love the company, we love the songs, the sermons make us feel good, but our hearts are not connected to Christ. We need to come before our God and see him as a God that loves you so dearly that he gave his son that through Jesus Christ you can and will have life abundantly. We need to submit and recognize that Jesus is Lord of all. And brothers and sisters, encourage us all. Make certain of your calling. I kind of glossed over at the very beginning. I, I love Jesus' declaration, his certain statement about himself and our God. There's no ambiguity. There's no wishy-washiness. I am the true vine. That's certainty. That's hope. My father is the vine dresser. Our God is working in our lives. It's his children. The vine gives us strength and energy, vitality to live. Christ gives us his spirit to live for him, changing us from within. And our Heavenly Father doesn't idly sit back and just watch and enjoy the show. He is active and involved in your life, pruning us. What a word, pruning. You know, I, I went to TAFE, became a horticulturalist, loved it. They, they often reminded us, make sure when you're pruning, your fingers are well out the way of the secateurs or the loppers. Uh, they often touted, you know, there was that guy, friend of a friend, he chopped and his finger came off as well. You know, some of these pruners, very sharp. And so it kind of reminds me in my mind, when God prunes, he really cuts, cuts deep. And he's cutting, he's cutting us to prune us to, so that we may bear more fruit. He cuts away the stuff that is going to be toxic in our lives. He's cutting away the things that take our eyes off Christ. But as his children, are we obeying? Are we hanging on to that dead wood? No, 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 God, I really, really like this. This is mine. You can cut everything else, but just keep, like, I love this dead branch and the way it's allowing pests and diseases into my life. Now, don't cut this one. 
And we can do that. No, it's all right. It's only a small part of my life. God doesn't mind about that bit. I know he's kind of saying I should get rid of it, but no, it's just a little bit. It doesn't matter. It's all good. It's all good. No. If God is laying on your heart that something's got to be removed, we've got to obey Christ. We've got to obey our Heavenly Father. Allow him to cut. And sometimes it might be relationships that we really treasure, but we know those relationships might not be right at this time. It might be a career path that we genuinely do want, but we know that it's going to have to cause compromise in our faith. We need to trust. Trust that what removes from me is for my benefit and what God gives me is far more abundant and amazing than I could ever imagine. We've got to trust even though that pruning hurts. God, our Heavenly Father, is doing it for our good. The Father is carefully and expertly working in our lives, making us more fruitful. Hebrews 12, verse 10 and 11 explains the Father, how the Father prunes us. For they, being earthly fathers, for earthly fathers discipline us for a short time, as seems best to them. You know, I can acknowledge that. As a dad, I've done my best. I don't always do it right. I do my best to encourage, discipline, raise my children. But he, God the Father, he disciplines us for our good so that we may share in his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet to those who are being trained by it, afterwards it yields peaceful fruit of righteousness. Trust God. Trust him. What you feel like you have to cut off and leave behind what he is telling you to prune. Trust that what you're giving up is nothing worthless compared to what he has for you. What a God. A perfect love that nurtures us helps us grow in love and righteousness into the image of his son. And I love the way this verse 8 finishes. My father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit, And so prove to be my disciple. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things... I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. All of this, all of us being connected to Christ, all of us allowing Christ to work through us, all of this allowing God the Father to prune and shape us is all for his glory. Everything that he does, filling us with joy, proving to us that we are his children through the fruit, gives glory to our God, our Heavenly Father. What a wonderful thing. 
that through Jesus Christ, as he shapes us, as he molds us and uses us, he is glorified by your life. Praise God. Let us come before our God now and we'll close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you that seeking your glory is truly the most satisfying, most fulfilling thing that we could do in this life. We thank you that through Jesus Christ, his spirit is filling us and strengthening us and guiding us to live a life that is fruitful. We thank you that you are active in our lives, pruning away those dead parts of our life and filling us with fruitful lives. Our Heavenly Father, we just come before you now and ask that as your children, you want us to have certainty in our faith. Help us to recognize the fruit that Jesus is producing in our lives. Help us to have a confidence and a certainty in our hope. Lord God, if we sit back and think, maybe that fruit isn't showing. If we're not seeing Christ shine in our lives, help us, Lord, to really wrestle with this truth. Please be a a rock in our shoe that we cannot ignore. Help us to come to a place where we truly recognise our need for a saviour and our utter and total dependence on him for a life that is worthwhile. I pray this in the glorious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Brothers and sisters, where musicians are going to come up, And we're going to sing together. Was it before the throne of God? I didn't think it was. No? This, that's what I thought it was. This life I live. It's not here. All right. So I'm just going to watch the screen as well. But please stand with us as we sing, This life I live is not my own.
Please be seated. Let's enjoy some fellowship together. Thank you. 